Welcome everyone. I'm Rita Ballas-Gordon, and as a member of the Action Collaborative on Neuroscience Training, an initiative of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Forum on Neuroscience and Nervous System Disorders, I'd like to welcome all of you to this virtual workshop on neuroscience training in challenging times. This workshop is being convened by the Neuroscience Forum and is the second in a series of virtual workshops aimed at illuminating critical issues in neuroscience training and providing a venue for sharing ways to move forward. Today's workshop will frame the impact of the global pandemic, which has affected scientists across the spectrum of career stages, as it has everyone in society, as well as the impact of, of a societal refocus on issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which have highlighted systemic fault lines in the culture of science that predated the pandemic and in many ways have been amplified by it. Today, we'll be framing some of these challenges, how they've impacted neuroscience trainees and scientists across different career stages and in different sectors from academia to industry and beyond. Like the other workshops in this series, we have convened two panels of participants and have allocated an hour for each panel discussion. The first panel consists of scientists across different career stages providing personal reflections on the challenges we face. And the second consists of institutional and thought leaders in our field reflecting on how they and their organizations have and can continue to address these challenges. Subsequent workshops will provide an opportunity for more in-depth discussion of some of the topics raised in today's workshop. The overarching goals of this series are to reflect on the events that have brought us to this pivotal moment for our society, for science, and in particular affect trainees, and consider what lessons we might take from this time of uncertainty to evolve not only training paradigms and goals, but also address the cultural change that's needed across the field. Our intention is to spark conversations about these issues, discuss challenges and areas where change is needed, and of course, ways to move forward. Now, no meeting or workshop, of course, can cover such a broad range of issues comprehensively. So we wish to open up a dialogue and inspire ongoing discussion, rethinking and action among individuals and institutions across the biomedical ecosystem. So I would like to thank the Action Collaborative members, and I believe there'll be a slide that comes up in just a moment that shows members of the collaboratives, um, uh, thank them for their hard work, and also thank the panelists for putting together this exciting program. Panelist biographies are available in the meeting handouts, which you can download from the event webpage. Now, a short proceedings document that summarizes the presentations and discussions from the workshop will be prepared and published by the National Academies Press. This will be publicly available in early April. There will be opportunities for attendees to ask questions, and we encourage you to do so through the question and answer box located on the workshop event page below the live broadcast. There's also a Slack workspace dedicated to this workshop series. We will be using that platform for an online discussion following the workshop from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we encourage everyone to participate. Okay, so it's my pleasure to moderate the first panel discussion, which is a conversation including personal perspectives on neuroscience training in challenging times, which will frame some of the major issues we face as individual scientists and also as a field, and how we can work together to engage and learn from one another, not only to uh, frame these challenges, but to brainstorm actions to effectively address them and drive the changes that are needed in training, inclusion, and scientific culture across the field. Our panelists for panel one today are Huda Akil. She is the Gardner Corton Distinguished University Professor of Neuroscience and Psychiatry and the co-director of the Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience Institute at the University of Michigan. Kristen Welly is an associate professor in the departments of neurosurgery and physiology and biophysics at the University of Colorado. AZA Stephen Alsop is a physician scientist who is currently conducting research and providing clinical care as a resident in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University. And Daniel Gonzalez is an HHMI Hannah Gray postdoctoral fellow in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue University. Their biographies are provided on the event page. 
So without further ado, let's jump in with the first question directed to Daniel Gonzalez. So Daniel, welcome. And I want to start off our discussion by asking you, what do you see as the most significant challenges, the areas where there is the greatest need for change that have been highlighted during the past year by the global pandemic and by the ongoing dialogues in all sectors of society around racial equity, diversity, and inclusion? Yeah, thank, thank you so much. First of all, thank you for all the organizers and thank you for, for um, organizing these fantastic panels. But um, there's so much we could talk about when it comes to thinking about what have we learned from this past year. Um, I'm a parent, so as a scientist parent, we've gone through a lot of challenges with respect to that. Being a postdoc during this time has been really unstable and challenging and financially challenging. Um, so there, there's a lot of things we, we could discuss, but I think you can't talk about this past year in 2020 without um, looking at racial justice and social justice and how, and, and the incredible need for institutional and cultural change within academia. Um, and so whenever I think about those things, there, there's many different ways to approach um, how do we solve some of these problems when it comes to inclusion and equity. And I think just one of the things that, the themes that kind of continually stands out to me, um, and one of the things that I'm just personally pushing for is just um, the need to build up these communities and the need to give trainees in particular, so postdocs and, and grad students, undergrads, um, of communities that, that look like them, that think like them, that, um, that give them a sense of belonging and value within academia. And so um, throughout all the challenges that we've had in 2020, I think one of the things that has been beneficial has been the normalization of, of moving virtual. And so um, I'm on Twitter a lot. If, if anybody follows me on Twitter, I'm sorry for, for some of the silly things I tweet, but I, but I, but I tweet a lot. And, and one of the things I started doing was just reaching out to people that I, I liked as scientists and I wanted to talk to. And I just started to say, hey, let's grab a coffee. And we'd grab a coffee, we talked about science, we talked about life things. Um, and then on, within social media as well, we, we, we've been able to um, see these movements like black in neuroscience or all these black in uh, cancer, black in metabolism, all these different fields of just building a sense of community. Um, I myself have been involved in um, something called the community of scholars and we're collaborating on different ways to, um, um, to amplify different communities and to, for example, um, we put out a list of, of 1000 um, inspiring black scientists recently. So just um, virtually, I find huge advantages for, for building these communities that um, have many different pros over really slow institutional change. So institutions, we should continue to push to, for, for change, but it's gonna be slow, it's gonna be a slog, it's gonna be committee after committee after committee. And I think virtually there's a way to build a really diverse um, community rapidly and, and, and you can become involved rapidly in many different, um, in, in many different ways. And so um, I think that we should continue to push for that um, and then as well, just gives you personally, gives me a sense of, I feel surrounded virtually by other postdocs and other graduate students and early career scientists who are dedicated to their science, but also um, pushing for change in academia as well. And so personally, it's been good for me just wanting to stay here and me, me feeling a sense of belonging that I'm raising up a, with a bunch of people um, um, that are pushing for change in academia. And so I, again, there's a huge amount of challenges, but I think building virtual communities is something that stands out to me as, as something we can improve on and continue to push for in order to approach some of these challenges with respect to equity and inclusion. Thank you, Daniel. As someone who is experiencing some Zoom fatigue, as we all do from time to time, you've done a very elegant job of reminding us of the power of connecting virtually and how that can create a community um, in the absence of being able to interact uh, in person. So thank you for that. I'm gonna turn now to Kristen Welly and ask you to reflect on the challenges and the areas needing change that you think have been underscored in the past year. Absolutely, and you know, thanks so much for, um, for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Um, and I really appreciated um, what, what Daniel was addressing about the, um, the new opportunities for community that have arisen over this past year. And you know, I would say that um, obviously we've been faced with this trifecta of challenges um, 
that we're all aware of, the global pandemic, this political turbulence, and, and then obviously this social reckoning regarding racial justice and, and white supremacy in our society. And it's been very difficult for all of us um, as, as neuroscientists, um, as, as Americans living in, in this society um, ac across the entire training spectrum. But you know, like Daniel mentioned, I think if you want to look for a silver lining, these challenges have um, unmasked some of the problems that are inherent in our in our current training paradigms and, and provided opportunities for us to address those and to make change. Um, and so from my perspective, you know, I think that as as neuroscientists, as, as members of the STEM community, I think that we have indulged ourselves a little bit too much in the um, sort of notion that we can just focus on the science, that you know, we can kind of come to lab and be in our, in our science bubble, um, and that we don't really need to address the rest of life and the rest of society outside, outside of lab and outside of science. And I think that if anything this year has shown that this, this approach doesn't work, it, it, it's not effective, it's not healthy, and it, it, it um, is holding us back from really growing um, as scientists. And so, you know, for, for one example, um, you know, this, the COVID pandemic has really revealed the truths about the difficulties that those of us with young children face. Um, you know, I have three young children myself, and so I can speak very personally to this, that um, it has always been a struggle to balance work and life. And this is not just true in science, it's true in many professions, um, but you know, our, our society does not create a lot of support structures for working parents. And um, you know, our institutions you know, likewise often don't have that much to offer. Um, and so, you know, as working parents, and, and often this job falls to, can fall to mothers, to women um, who are scientists, um, you know, it's our responsibility to construct these often very elaborate and precarious networks of support that allow us to, to be both parents and have a family and, and work in science. And, um, you know, these, it feels as a mother, like we're often creating these sort of Rube Goldberg machines that kind of keep everything going um, in, in our work and life. And, you know, often this is all hidden out of sight. It's not something that's talked about. It's not something that's really um, brought to the forefront. Um, and it can feel that this, uh, like, expenditure of effort is, is sometimes ignored. And so, you know, I think that COVID came through, tore down so many of these support structures that we've also mm -hmm. carefully assembled, but also brought to life these light, brought to light these struggles. I think it's more difficult for for um, people to ignore that those of us with young children are are really working double time to make it work as parents. Um, and I think, you know, importantly, as as Daniel mentioned, like. Um, the the silver linings here have been that you know being at home more, having virtual meetings, um, having virtual conferences, um, conducting our our science over Zoom. A lot of times it can work, and it can work really well, um, and it gives us more freedom to create this work life balance that we need. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, also, you know, our travel has been uh, really mitigated this year, which has been another unexpected benefit and maybe points to the need that perhaps we were expecting too much, um, too much travel. You know, maybe we don't need to physically go all over the country, you know, many times a month. And instead, we should take some of these new observations and opportunities that COVID has forced upon us and, and integrate them into our lives moving forward. Um, you know, and I also just, you know, want to say that, um, you know, another, another obvious area where we really just, just can't just focus on the science any longer um, is by pretending that social and political struggles, you know, don't exist and don't affect us in the lab. This summer's protest against police injustice towards our Black colleagues and Black Americans, um, it was felt by all of us, by our trainees, by our faculty, um, the political turmoil is also is felt yeah. by us. And, you know, I think that um, we as scientists need to give ourselves permission and space to acknowledge this, to um, have difficult conversations um, and create these uh, this space within our training processes. We need to allow our students to acknowledge um, that these issues are extremely real to them they affect them and they, they influence us as scientists. Um, 
you know, neuroscience has historically, like many other sciences, has been historically a very white, very male dominated field. And we're, we're making progress, but hoping for change passively is not enough. This past year has shown us that we really need to acknowledge our role in upholding some of these, um, these structures that um, prom have promoted this sort of white male centric viewpoint. And we need to work towards changing these racist structures. And so I would conclude um, that, you know, in my perspective, um, you know, over this year, I think um, the, the, the glimmer of hope is that uh, perhaps we can learn from these challenges, learn that we can't just focus on the science. We instead need to address all of our, our lives um, and everything that's going on in society around us and um, actively work to change, to make changes within our structures. Thank you, Kristen. So I wanna to turn to AZA. Um, uh, AZA, your work has focused on the neuroscience and psychology of social cohesion and social bias and how these are affected during times of stress. And we would probably all agree that the last year fits the definition of a time of extraordinary stressors on scientists at, at all career stages and as Christian very eloquently noted across all sectors of society from a variety of, of directions. So AZA, I wanna ask you, how can we use the insights from the science that you're, you're doing on social cohesion and bias to address the stressors of the past year and achieve the changes we'd all like to see in the culture of science, in particular inclusivity across the ecosystem and at all career stages? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. And thank you to the Action Collaborative for the opportunity to uh, share this space and offer uh, some thoughts in what I think is a really critical conversation for us to happen. Um, obviously, you can look at me and see that I'm a person of African descent. And so my experience growing up uh, both in the Caribbean and here uh, in many different places in the US really shaped how I, I viewed society and shaped, you know, even the things I think are interesting to study. And so social dynamics was something that as I navigated, it became very clear to me that um, there was, were lots of very interesting things that shaped the ways in which people interact with each other um, socially. And so my training really was starting to ask, like, what can we use in terms of our neuroscience and systems tools to begin understanding at a deeper level how this is founded in biology? I think oftentimes when we think of these problems, we approach them from a place that puts them in this uniquely human frame. But it, it, the fundamental problem of like what social cues matter and how should I uh, bias my behavior in certain social contexts is just a behavioral problem that animals have to solve. And we can see that in Drosophila, we can see it in rodents. Um, there's beautiful work coming out of Peggy Mason's lab uh, that showed, for instance, rats can learn to show this pro-social helping behavior to rats that are in their own strain, but they won't show it to another strain uh, but if you cross foster them during development with that other strain as adults, they show that pro-social behavior to their to the other strain and not their own strain, right? So there's fundamental biology there. And so a lot of what my work is trying to do is, is begin using that to, to understand the ways in which we um, approach solving these problems. First, looking at the biology and then asking as humans, we've now embedded into this biology, psychological constructs like racism, white supremacy, patriarchy. And how does that shape the way that that um, behaviors function? So there's a lot of things there, um, both in terms of thinking about the kinds of pharmacological agents that can shape social behavior, but then thinking more deeply about the types of social cues that are in the context that we're asking trainees to navigate and how that plays into sort of that fundamental biology. Um, when we think about things like observational fear, if I have a trainee that's seeing these social cues, we know that in rodents, we know that in Drosophila, you can enlist and uh, these animals can learn fear behavior even when they don't actually experience it themselves through vicarious learning. The same has been shown in humans as well. So how do all these things shape the emotional state of trainees as they navigate in these, um, in these uh, um, environments? I think we can also learn from social psychology where there've been very uh, different interventions such as wise feedback and the social belonging intervention that have already shown within academic context to um, allow trainees that are coming from uh, diverse backgrounds and historically disadvantaged backgrounds to actually achieve much higher academic success, uh, much better emotional wellness. But many of these things are not um, being instituted in departments that are working towards um, you know, shifting the culture. Um, I think another example of this is BJ Fogg's behavioral model of like, how do you change behavior? Because fundamentally, if I'm within an academic department that's trying to 
become anti-racist. And my, me, me and my partner, when we work with, with institutions that are thinking about like, how do we go about uh, driving cultural change? Fundamentally, we are trying to change behavior. Yet when you look at the things that BJ Fox says, go into changing behavior, motivation, ability, and triggers. Sometimes when you have discussion with leaders and ask them, so, you know, how are we, how are we setting up this structure? What are the policies, what are the frameworks that are actually motivating this new behavior that we want to see people do? Have we given people the tools? How are we shaping their ability to actually engage in this new behavior? And then what are the triggers? And how intentional are we being about actually using what we know from social psychology and social neuroscience to arrive at these uh, end, end games? So I think there's lots of work uh, being done both in um, sort of thinking about things at the institutional level and the, the, uh, the social psychology level, but I think also really trying to understand the fundamental neurobiology and looking at this as innately a biological problem that we've now embedded some psychological frameworks into, I think it op opens up a, a number of different avenues to, to actually start getting at change in a, in a tangible way and meeting people at the, the, the place where their behavior is being shaped, which is the brain. Thank you, ACA. That was a terrific reflection. Um, and thank you for kind of bringing together these threads from uh, kind of the research perspective to what we're experiencing day to day and how we might drive social change. I, I want to turn to Huda and ask you to share your thoughts about how collectively we might change the kinds of behaviors that AZA just highlighted um, and how we might do that if you're a senior leader like you are from the top down or someone at an early career stage like AZA from the bottom up and how the tools at our disposal and the stakes and the risks for individuals are different depending on one's career stage. Yeah, thank you, Rita. This is great. And I want to. Uh, thank also the, my predecessors in this panel, because I think they both uh, were able to shine a light on the challenges, but also give us hope about the future. So I wanna start by saying that young people have a lot of power, probably much more power than they realize. And good ideas have a lot of power. And groups as were described here, and partnerships as were described, including through now, you know, uh, at a distance through Zoom and so on, have a lot of power. And that is because no matter what, this country likes youth, likes energy, and institutions can get ossified. And whether we know it or not, the driving force for change does come from the young and from people who are creative and smart. But there is a gap as implied in your question and by AZA from where these wonderful ideas are and how institutions can adopt them. And I see my job as a scientist, as a senior scientist or a mentor or even an intermediate level PI if they're out there. Uh, and as somebody who heads an institute or chairs a department, as the translators, as people who hopefully have not forgotten their own excitement, their own youth, their own love of new ideas, and putting pressure on institutions to take that energy and catalyze it and move it into actual change. Learning about good ideas and then showing that um, a happier, more engaged, more supported, of a scientific community, be they women with children or people from uh, various racial backgrounds are actually better for science. That this is not just something we're doing anybody as a favor. This is the greater good for everybody at every level. And we need to convince them and translate that through our own behavior and how we treat our people in how we write evaluation in how we recruit and how we message what is important. And the last thing I will say is institutions are, while sometimes rigid and unmovable, are also competitive among each other. Okay. So all it takes is one creative dean or one creative president who will listen. So if we're all mounting an effort in multiple places, multiple sizes, one listens and it's successful and I believe it will be, it will spread as a good idea, it will be contagious. So I have faith we can do it if we work it from the bottom up as well as the top down. Thank you, Huda, that was a great call to arms too. So uh, it'll be interesting to listen in on panel two and how 
Uh, they might amplify and address some of the important points that you just raised about the institutional response and the, the power of listening to that what's bubbling up uh, from the ground up. So I wanna to turn to Kristen next and ask you, Kristen, how we might evolve training paradigms and goals to reflect the changing culture of science and the change we want to drive and balance the value of depth in training to develop expertise in a given area with the value of breadth of perspectives and experiences to prepare scientists for a range of career choices in academia for sure, but also beyond academia. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that this is such a critical question at this juncture. You know, neuroscience is a is a changing field. Our science has evolved incredibly over the last, you know, many decades, number of decades. Um, and the way that we do science is changing. You know, science is becoming more interdisciplinary, um, more translational. And we're relying more and more on team science. I mean, you know, the number of papers that you see with many authors is growing exponentially because, you know, working together, we can do bigger and in some cases, in many cases, better science. Um, and so, you know, our training paradigms should also be reflecting this change. We, you know, we shouldn't be using the same training protocols that we've been using for, for decades upon decades um, in the face of our, our changing science. Um, and I think one of the main uh, areas of reflection for us should be on this thought of a sort of linear training protocol where you progress um, you know, in a very narrow and stereotyped way from, from undergraduate, grad school, and then extended postdoctoral training, and then finally to a faculty job. Um, and you know, I, I think we should pause and question, you know, is this really the only route to become a successful neuroscientist. Um, it, is, it, is one, it is one route that, that works, but um, I believe that to meet the needs of broader and more expansive science, we need a broader and more expansive understanding of our training plan. Um, and I'm gonna draw on my own um, experience uh, as an example. Um, I did a, a, a somewhat sort of traditional neuroscience, um, systems neuroscience graduate, um, work uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. But after that, um, I took a, a sort of a detour. And instead of and moving on to a traditional postdoctoral fellowship, I went and worked in a government lab um, in the Food and Drug Administration in the Center for Devices. And while I was there, I actually had the opportunity to, to establish and, and build a new research program on looking at long-term safety and effectiveness of brain-computer interface devices. Um, and this was an incredible experience for me. I was able to work um, with multiple government agencies. I worked with colleagues at NIH, at DARPA, at the VA, at the Department of Defense. I got to know and grow an incredible network of colleagues. Um, also, uh, while I was um, running a research program, I was also able to engage in the policy and regulatory decision um, parts of the FDA, uh, which really opened my eyes up to what it means to have a successful translational research program, um, and also what what it means what what is necessary for device development. And so essentially I gained exposure to this diverse array of perspectives that um, I would never have had an opportunity to engage with in a traditional postdoc. Um, you know, and I've been able to um, I, after I, about five years, I did then re-enter back into academia and took an academic position here at the University of Colorado. Um, but I brought with me all of these perspectives and experiences that have greatly shaped my own, my current research program um, and the, the types of uh, collaborations that I'm able to engage in now and, and the types of research that I'm able to do. And so, you know, I think that, um, I think that those experiences made me a much better scientist, a stronger scientist with a clearer understanding of where I want my research program to go and what could be most beneficial for society. And so, you know, I think that by broadening our experiences, we, we benefit as scientists. And I, you know, I want to say that um, in my field, which is sort of a neural engineering field, it kind of rides at the space between neuroscience and, and medical device technology for the nervous system. Um, I've had the opportunity to work 
work with many engineers. And I think in some ways there, neuroscience can, can learn some things from the field of engineering. In engineering, there is um, not necessarily the expectation that everyone's gonna go straight into academic science. Instead, uh, there's the understanding that graduate students have a wide menu of options to choose after they finish their PhD program. They can go into industry, they can go into consulting, they can go into government, they can go and stay in academic research. And, um, you know, graduate mentors understand that and promote that. They help, they work with students to understand what their trajectory looks like, where they're headed. They may tailor their training programs to help them really achieve their goals, regardless of, you know, whether they stay within academia or not. Um, and I think that that's a, a fabulous approach to, to training and something that we could really easily integrate is just um, broadening our appreciation for where people may be headed and, and helping to tailor their training programs so that they can get there. And you know, I, I think we need, um, you know, we should step back. People might say, well, why would we want to do that? Um, but I think as neuroscientists, we need to step back and say, it's good for science and it's good for society if we have neuroscientists in a, in a plethora of careers. You know, we want neuroscientists in public policy, in public health. We want neuroscientists to be engaging in, in law and spheres of law and patents and you know, all of sort of the decision levers of our science, of our society. We would, you know, we need that perspective to be um, represented. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's good for, for us. Um, personally to grow our perspectives, but it's good for neuroscience and society in general if we encourage neuroscientists to fan out and, and in, engage in all aspects of our society. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, we, we should refrain from thinking of um, people as pursuing sort of alternative paths or alternative careers and instead broaden our understanding of what a path and what a career looks like. And that there can be many different twists and turns along along the route, and that's okay. That brings strength. It's not a weakness. That's great, Kristen. I could not agree with you more. As someone who's kind of evolved a career um, from traditional academia to industry, and now uh, in very entrepreneurial space, I think you said it very well that the nonlinearity and the breadth only amplify. Um, the, the kinds of science we can do and the impact that that science has across all sectors of society. So thank you. And I wanna to turn to AZA now to ask you to reflect really on the same kind of question, what you think is needed to change training paradigms and even institutional structures that support training that may be outdated to foster an inclusive and supportive training environment across the entire arc of a career. Yeah, I think uh, I love uh, what Christine was saying. Uh, I think uh, the way I think about it is really redefining what the benchmarks are and, and what success is. Um, I don't think that in and of itself is novel, but I think sometimes we aren't thinking carefully about the legacy of white supremacy within academia and what that means for the genesis of our benchmarks of success and like what we consider like the quintessential scientist by which everything else will then be measured. And so as a person of African descent, for instance, being really like loving science from a very young age, I knew about people like, you know, George Washington Carver and, you know, the, I know knew about some, you know, ancient, you know, kept, you know, comedic scientists and things like this. But when it came to academic, you know, being in academia here, there was a very clear benchmark and everything else was going to be compared to that. And that's not just from uh, an academic st standpoint, but also from a sociocultural standpoint. And so I think part of really getting to the place that we want to go, part of how we motivate um, and give people the ability and sort of trigger the things that will go about behavioral changes, starting to think fundamentally about what are we trying to achieve with science and how do we best define success? How do we best define the benchmark? So that's inclusive from the start not holding on to old benchmarks and then trying to find ways to make them inclusive, but really fundamentally ask what would be inclusive benchmarks and how do we then redefine everything in light of that? And what that I think does is now it creates a new psychological paradigm which in, within which you know, uh, trainees now are coming in with a very different view of what it means to be in science, what it means to be a scientist. What does a scientist look like, talk like, act like? Uh, and, and then how is a scientist successful? Great, so, so thank you, AZA. I mean, you, you set me up beautifully for the next question I'd like to explore um, by touching on the notion of benchmarks of success in science and how these might be outdated. And I'd like to turn now to ask Huda 
how do we define success in science and how does that definition need to change for trainees and across uh, the length and the fluidity of a career as we drive the cultural change that we think is needed across the entire field. Sorry, I was muted. I wanna thank AZA because he, he really framed the question perfectly. I remember being on a committee uh, looking at clinical departments and research in the context of clinical departments and asking uh, uh, one of the chairs how he defined a successful scientist in his department. And he said, someone who has at least two R1s. And I said, okay, and what else? And he said, and then a high H factor. And everybody took notes and everybody sort of went on with the conversation. And I, I remember this is one of those moments which crystallized everything. Not just what he said right away without hesitation, but also that everybody else thought it was a good answer. And I was just thinking to myself, if I had asked this guy, what would you think is a good partner for one of your children? And he had said a $200,000 salary. Would everybody say, oh yeah, that's a great criterion. This is really how you should find people and you know, judge them. So why, and so that makes me ask, why are we accepting these soulless, simple-minded measures of success, whether it is dollars per square foot or numbers of citation. I'm not saying they're not indicative of something, but they should not be the be all and end all of how we see ourselves. And whatever we're doing, we're creating this culture where from the youngest to the most senior, we have this imposter syndrome because we've created criteria that are incredibly, uh, you know, not only impossible to, achieve, but there is always somebody doing it better. So it's completely personally meaningless. So that one's own success cannot be quantified and measured in that way. So I feel like sort of derivative markers have become measures and accepted by promotion committees, by as we do annual meetings, as we hire people on new jobs, in a way that did not need to be there and did not used to be there to begin with. It's just sort of this um, reductive approach to trying to be objective that has been actually rather toxic. And I put that in the context of the nature of science itself, which gives us a very different perspective on what failure and success means. If you're a scientist, you are supposed to accept failure because you're asking big questions, because you're putting your ideas on the line, because you're exploring something that nobody has already done. And you learn that it's okay to fail on the way to success. But we are not taking these notions and generalizing them to our career successes or failures in a way that is meaningful. We're accepting some external, simple-minded view of uh, failure and success that's hurtful, but it's especially hurtful when you listen to what people are confronting, whether they have a different racial background or a different cultural background or have children at home or you know different scientific perspective. It's especially painful to them. And we all know that the more stress you put on people, the more you narrow their ability to focus, to concentrate, to be creative, or to handle further stressors. So we're actually stressing people unduly and actually competing with whatever creative energy there is for science. It's, it's not just inhumane, it's actually counterproductive. So thank you for that, uh, Huda. I, I know that we have spoken in the past about kind of two dimensions of defining success. It's not just what you actually do, but there's also the dimension of how you do it and how, you, how the institutions that we work at enable you 
uh, to do your work. And you've, you've kind of woven together those different uh, aspects really very nicely. And, and I wanna turn next to Daniel and ask you, Daniel, what your thoughts are on how the way we define success and, and some of the points that Huda just raised may turn out to directly inhibit inclusion and com community building to you know, imperatives that we very much collectively would like to achieve. Yeah, I think there's a really straightforward answer to how our current standards for success inhibit um, inclusion. And it's simply by our current standards do not value efforts to build communities, to provide effective mentorship, to uh, build up the next generation of scientists, right? And so um, that's why we're inhibiting um, equity in academia by um, simply not valuing efforts to um, increase diversity and inclusion in academia. And so one of the things that I'm, I, I'm personally trying to do is just um, kind of shift my mindset um, in a way um, that, that sort of reframes my efforts to um, increase diversity and, and equity in, in science. And so I, I think the mindset shift I'm trying to do is just, um, so maybe some background is that I'm a physicist. And so what physicists do to solve problems sometimes is that we look at the extremes, right? So like we take an equation, we look at what is the, the, the extreme on this side, what's the extreme on this side, therefore the solution is somewhere in the middle. And so um, we, we can look at the extreme side where we only focus on bench work. Um, and, and those type of things, but we're not doing anything to build up the next generation of scientists. That means whenever we are old and we're gone and retired, there's nobody else to carry forward the science. Um, we can also look at the other extreme where we're only, where we're foregoing bench work, we're only focusing on um, community building and those type of things. And in that case, science isn't being done. So therefore the, the solution is somewhere in the middle. And what we need to do is, is, is value not just bench work and citations and papers, but realize that our efforts to build communities and amplify marginalized communities, that those things are advancing the entire scientific endeavor, right? That's what we try to do. That, that, that's, what, that's what my lab work is trying to do, right? I'm trying to push the entire field of neuroscience and technology. I'm trying to push those things forward not just for my own benefit, but just for the benefit of science, right? And so we, we need to reframe our mindset into thinking that our efforts to um, better ourselves as mentors, to build up communities, our efforts to increase inclusion, that these are advancing the entire scientific endeavor. And I think whenever we have that mindset shift, we start to value those things more. We start to figure out really tangible ways of incorporating those things into our definition of success. And I think maybe who does a good, a good, so one of the things that I do struggle about with this topic is um, I think a lot of people would agree that we need to redefine success, but like, I, again, I still struggle with practically, how do we do that? So for, for Huda, who's somebody who's been in the, the field for a while, and you've, I'm sure you've been on many search committees, I'm a postdoc, I would be applying to the job market in a few years. How, I, I still struggle with practically whenever you're looking at somebody's CV, you're deciding if they're going to be a good fit in your department. How do you weigh these things differently in, in your viewpoint versus kind of the, the historical classical way of doing things? Yeah, so, uh, you know, sometimes big ideas get translated sort of in little mechanical ways, as you probably know, as somebody who develops technologies. So ask somewhat different questions. For example, on a search committee, don't just look at the number of papers but ask questions about how somebody has contributed in other ways to science or to the scientific community. Ask them to, ask people to tell us about themselves and what they care about. I feel like when we're recruiting, for example, whether I'm recruiting somebody into my lab as part of a team, into a graduate program, or as a young faculty member, or even a senior colleague, you're recruiting somebody who's gonna be your partner on a journey. And it, it's not just about the number of paper they have. It's what kind of human being you have, whether it's gonna be your collaborator, your neighbor, or you're gonna share students, or you're just sharing science as a community. We wanna know who they are. And so we wanna find out more. In shock talks, in uh, interviews, in forms, let's add some questions. And let's take that seriously, whether it's about their DEI efforts, whether it's about their community engagement. 
their hopes about the future and how they want to use their science and deploy it the way Kristen said we can't ignore the role of science in, in the world. I mean, look at COVID and mental illness and other brain disorders. So let's talk about it and act like we value it. When we write letters of recommendations and promotions for tenure, let us put all of this on the table and not just measure success by the way my, my buddy does with how many R01s and an H factor. Let's add dimension to it that are meaningful. So both the what and the how, Huda. So, so very, very well said. So thank you for that. And um, in the few minutes that we have remaining, and I am certain like many of you on the panel and many of the people in the audience, I feel like we've just scratched the surface of a, of a number of very interesting topics. But anticipating the discussion in panel two, which includes senior and institutional leaders and which will follow um, after a short break from this panel, I'd like to get some final thoughts from each of you on what those leaders could do to partner with scientists at different career stages to improve training, inclusion, redefine what success looks like, and support the cultural change that each of you has highlighted um, in, during the last hour and that is needed across the field. So I'll start with Daniel um, and ask you just very briefly um, for, for your thoughts. I think, uh, again, as a postdoc and thinking about the transition to faculty and whether I'm prepared for that, and is it is, is my postdoctoral training preparing me for that? I, I think there should be a, a more institutional shift to changing the way that we train postdocs to give them more breadth rather than, again, just focusing on bench work and papers, right? And so incorporating standards for a postdoctoral training includes not just the bench work and papers and, and can you think and do science, but can you mentor, can you manage people, can you um, you know, do all these other things that are incredibly important whenever it comes to being a principal investigator. And I think there's actually a panel um, in a couple of weeks on that topic. Uh, and so I, I think I would definitely tune in for that. That's great, thank you. Kristen, how about your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, you know, what I would love to see is, um, really the the sort of top down buy in in changing metrics and changing what is valued at all levels of career transition and so i think who would have spoke beautifully to the power of of young people changing the system and i firmly agree you know you are right but as you also mentioned it is so necessary to also have the top down buy in and you know what we need are leaders who are willing to rethink how do we evaluate um, faculty trainees at, at every level, um, you know, and often this happens in promotion processes or admissions processes. You know, what? How can we create new metrics and standards for evaluation that really reflect the values that we want to promote, that reflect the type of science we want to be doing? And so, you know, from my perspective, I think putting um, value on different perspectives, experiences, um, different backgrounds, and these can be sort of um, cult different cultural backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, or different training backgrounds, having different types of training experiences and giving people, identifying people who may not look like sort of the stereotypical candidate, um, but who can bring something new and bring a new perspective. And so, you know, what does this mean? I mean, this means um, adding new criteria for promotions to, um, to really uh, benefit or, or really emphasize uh, good mentorship or leading diversity effort and inclusion initiatives on campus, being a national leader to um, create programs, to bring more people, pipeline programs, bring more people into science. You know, these should be more heavily emphasized in the promotions process. Likewise with, um, with interviews and admissions, you know, how can we standardize our, or how can we change the structures of our interview process so that we are really um, drawing from the widest talent pool, casting the widest possible net and understanding um, how differences in backgrounds are 
are an advantage and, and not a hindrance. And so I think that these types of changes are most easily made from the top by the tone that the leadership sets um, and kind of by giving permission to those who are making these decisions, the faculty, the, you know, the other students who are uh, engaging in interviews, for instance, to, um, to really broaden their perspective and their criteria. So that's what Thank I Thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. ACA, for, for your thoughts? I mean, I think- uh, Final wrap up? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, things have already been so beautifully said. I think I'll, I'll just be echoing some of that, but, uh, you know, I think change is happening, you know, in the country um, and, and our academic culture is really just a reflection of that. And so things are also changing here. And I think there are those who resist change and then there are those who excitedly embrace change and think about ways to move it forward. And I think having leaders who embrace change and want to have stakeholders in the community who want to have true stakeholders in trainees and who are really actively seeking to understand this new social cultural world that we're living in, how that's going to impact, you know, who's going to be in science, um, having those leaders and then having them create very intentional structures within their departments for those trainees, not just to have a space to vent, but to, you know, intentionally and um, uh, interact with administration to actually drive, you know, pragmatic changes. And so I think that's, that's something that leaders can always think about is not only just creating space for trainees to actually have a voice and a seat at the table, um, but then how is that voice going to be translated into uh, decision making? Thank you, AZA. And Huda, I'll end with you to kind of tie together your very eloquent call to redefine what success looks like to what we need to do to drive changes in that definition um, as individuals with our with our senior leaders with our institutional leaders so academia should lead society meaningful societal change it should not just echo it and follow it and this is a moment with anti-racism with what the pandemic has done to show inequities at multiple levels that it's very clear how unfair and difficult it is. And yet science is this world that can actually unite people from the love of science, can unite us from everywhere. We might have different religious and cultural background and so on, but science is a place where we can come together. It's a really great opportunity for a beautiful experiment that academia can do to show how you can use the love of the truth, the love of science, the desire to do well for our society as also a context to drive true anti-racism, true anti-discrimination of every kind and promote a more enlightened humanist view of how we generate knowledge and how we share this knowledge. It's really up to them. It's a great opportunity for somebody out there, some president out there to do it and run with it. Thank you, very eloquently said. Um, I wanna wrap us up by just noting that as I'm sure you heard throughout this last hour, there are a number of topics that are really worthy of much further exploration. And some of these will be the topics of the upcoming workshops, a diversity, diversity, inclusion and equity, postdoctoral training, changing the culture of science. And together with Daniel, Kristen, AZA and Huda, um, I, I know you'll join me in looking forward to those discussions. So thank you all for a wonderful hour, which flew by. I wanna thank the attendees and the audience who stuck with us for this hour. We are going to now take a brief five minute break and reconvene at 1 p.m. for the second hour long panel discussion of this workshop. Thanks and see you soon. <laughs>